There is no one who knows me, or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. They know they're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you because I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about what I'm telling you, the kind of things I'm telling you, is me. This is True Crime Out Loud. This week's podcast contains explicit language and explicit content. Listener discretion is advised. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. And this week's case starts out in Anchorage, Alaska. It's going to move to several different locations, but it's going to start there. So we're going to give you a little information about Anchorage, Alaska. There's 288,000 residents in Anchorage, Alaska, and that makes it the most populated city. It's larger in land area than the state of Rhode Island. Anchorage, Alaska has about 380 sworn police officers, and compared to other U.S. cities of similar size, they have a little higher violent crime rate and a little lower property crime rate. Alaska as a whole has a very high sexual assault rate. In fact, it's three times higher than the national average for forcible rape. One of the geographic oddities of Anchorage is that it is nine and a half air miles from 90% of the industrialized world. It is the home of a joint military base comprised of the Elmendorf Air Force Base and Fort Richardson Army Base. So there's a lot of military in that area. Yes. A relatively decent number of residents, but a huge land area, it sounds like. We're going to start this case with the abduction of Samantha Tesla Koenig. Samantha was 18 years old. And she worked at the Common Grounds Coffee Stand in Anchorage, Alaska. And it's a small roadside stand. It's not like a Starbucks or one of these other places where you go in, you can order your drink and have a seat. It's basically a walk-up. And you have to walk up into a window and order. Kind of like ice cream businesses that we have here in the South. Well, on Wednesday, February 1st, 2012... Her boyfriend was supposed to pick her up after work, but she wasn't there, and she didn't answer her phone, and he was concerned, and he really wasn't sure what to do, so he went home to talk to her family. Now, the boyfriend and Samantha both lived with Samantha's father. Later that night, the boyfriend received a text from Samantha, and it said she was tired, she was going on vacation, and she was just moving away. And we later learn that her boss also received a similar text about her going away and going on vacation. This this kind of thing always puzzles me. I, I mean, what, you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, no one ever just says, bye, loved ones, I'm going on a vacation via text. Well, you're right about that because this is when the boyfriend and the family knew that something was wrong. So they call the police. The next day, the police go to the coffee stand where they're able to watch the surveillance footage. And here's what they see. Just before 8 p.m., which was closing time, a masked man came up to the order window where Samantha handed him something. And then she backs away from the window with her hands raised. And it's like you would raise your hands if somebody was pointing a gun at you, basically in the don't shoot stance. She then turns off the lights, and then this masked man jumps through the window into the coffee stand. You can see Samantha and this man walking away from the business. Well, this told them immediately that this was an abduction. So who do the police look at first? Of course, boyfriend, family, friends. Well, boyfriend and family were just quickly ruled out. Anchorage PD and the FBI said they had zero leads and had no idea where to start. Now, let's go back. Remember, Samantha was abducted February 1st. Well, on February 24th, about three weeks after the abduction, at 7.45 p.m., her boyfriend received another text from Samantha's phone. All this text said was Connor Park, under picture of Albert, Ain't she pretty? And I'm actually putting a screenshot of this text on our website so you can see that. The family immediately rushed to the park and they've called the police. 
well once they get to the park there's this outdoor bulletin board it's kind of where you can post um, a missing pet or upcoming events that kind of thing well on this bulletin board there was a posting for a missing dog named Albert underneath that was a Ziploc style bag and they could see something in it but the family didn't touch it and waited for the police good move on their part well inside this Ziploc bag was a ransom note it was telling the family to deposit $30,000 into Samantha's account. There was also a picture of Samantha and she was holding a recent newspaper. So this let them know, okay, Samantha's still alive. We got to give money. We have proof of life. And, and it kind of gave them a positive feeling after three weeks of not knowing anything. And I'm also going to put this picture on our website that you can see of Samantha with the newspaper. Well, Samantha's father, with the help of the community, put $5,000 into Samantha's bank account. On March 1st, her card was used at an ATM in Alaska. Well, the suspect had his face and head covered along with gloves, so they could not tell anything about the person. A week later, on March 7th, the ATM card was used again in Wilcox, Arizona. Now, Wilcox, Arizona is 4,000 miles away from Anchorage. It was used the next day on March 8th in Lordsburg, New Mexico. And then it was used again on March 8th in Shepherd, Texas. Then on March 10th, it was used in Humble, Texas. So looking at this timeline of where the ATM card's been used, it tells the FBI, hey, Whoever this is, they're heading east along the I-10 corridor. So what they do is they send out a, a bolo or a be on the lookout to all the police agencies across the U.S. and specifically those along the I-10 corridor to say, hey, we need you to look out for something. Here's that something they wanted people to look out for. From the footage of where the suspect used the ATM in Arizona, in the background, they could see a white Ford Focus. Now that's all they saw. There wasn't a tag or any identifying information. So the BOLO goes out, hey, a white Ford Focus, be on the lookout for it. So police all over the U.S., of course, are looking for a white Ford Focus that's out of place or may have an out-of-state tag. Well, on March 13th, this vigilant state trooper in Texas sees a vehicle fitting the description. It's a white Ford Focus, and it's in a hotel parking lot where a man comes out and gets into the vehicle. He drives off in the car and is immediately stopped by the state trooper. The person driving this car gives the state trooper his identification, and he's identified as Israel Keys. Well, the FBI and police say, who the heck is Israel Keys? They had never even heard his name. Well, in a search of his car, they find Samantha's debit card, her cell phone, a gun, and even the disguise used in the ATM photos. Of course, Israel Keys is immediately arrested. So two weeks after this arrest, Israel Keys is extradited back to Alaska. So here's what we know about Israel Keys. At the time of his arrest in Texas, he was 34 years old. He had been born in Cove, Utah, the second of 10 children to John Jeffrey and Heidi Keys. They did not believe in any kind of government interference. They were anti-government. They homeschooled all their children, and Israel mainly grew up in Colville, Washington. And they lived in this isolated cabin-style home apart from society. Uh, everything we found on them suggested that, you know, they were poor, there was no power in the home, and the family was part of the Christian identity theology, which focuses on white supremacy. So not a good environment to be growing up in. Right. An anti-government, white supremacist, kind of separatist lifestyle. In the 1990s, the family moved to Malpin, Oregon. And Israel joined the army in 1998, where he went to Egypt, Fort Hood, Texas, and Fort Lewis, Washington. He received an honorable discharge in July of 2001. 
At the time of his arrest, the only thing in his criminal history was a DUI that he had gotten while he was in the Army. And he uh, worked in the construction contractor business, known to be a very skilled carpenter. He lived in Washington State from 2001 until 2007, and then he had moved to Anchorage in 2007 where he had lived in a home with his girlfriend and a 10-year-old daughter of his from a previous relationship. So once the police in Alaska and the FBI get Israel, their first question is, hey, where is Samantha? Because at the time, he does have all this evidence in his car but he could just be a guy using her debit card. Well, they quickly learn that that's not the case. What he tells them about Samantha is that he had killed her. But before he would tell the full story, he wanted a particular type of coffee, a Snickers bar, and a particular cigar. Once he was given that, he gave them the entire story. And it is a story. He said he chose this coffee place because it was open later than others. He didn't choose Samantha. She just happened to be the one working there. It was more about the location. He said he pointed a 22 caliber handgun at her. He had her turn off the lights. He jumped through the window and into the coffee stand. He zip tied her hands and then he forced her to leave with him. He says after they exited the business, She broke free, and he had to tackle her. And they were actually able to see on the video footage, and I will put links to where you can see these surveillance videos, but it's like at the top corner, so you can't really see what's going on. But come to find out when he tells them that it was where he tackled her because she was trying to get away. He then told her he was only going to take her for ransom, but this was just a ruse to get her to be more cooperative He said it was an absolute lie. He knew he was going to murder her. That was his whole intent. But she didn't have her ATM card with her, which he wanted that because he did want to get money out of her account. She told him it was in the truck of her boyfriend. So he takes Samantha to his home, his home being Israel's home, and he chains her up in this shed in his yard. He then went to the home of the boyfriend and got the ATM card out of the truck. During this, the boyfriend comes out, sees a man wearing a mask, so he runs back in the house to get help from Samantha's father, and they come back outside. Well, at this point, Israel Keys has run away, but not before getting the ATM card that he wanted. Israel says he gets the ATM card, then he returns to the shed where he rapes Samantha. After he did that, he strangled her to death. He said his family had no idea she was in there. The police said he talked so casual about this murder, it was like talking about what he had for lunch that day. Well, within hours of killing Samantha, he left Anchorage for a cruise with his family. And Samantha was abducted on February 1st. In the morning hours of February 2nd is when he leaves Anchorage. And he drives to New Orleans. And the cruise didn't leave out till February 6th. So February 6th through February 11th, he was on this Caribbean cruise. So what happened to Samantha during this time? He said he left her in the shed, dead. And I checked the temperature during that time of year, and it said the average temperature was a high of 26 degrees. So he could leave her in the shed. It was cold enough outside that it would preserve her body and keep the decomposition and the smells from being noticed while he was gone for two weeks. So he gets back from his cruise on February 11th. Well, on February 16th, he is in Aledo, Texas, where he sets a house on fire. They don't know why he burned this house or what it has to do with his series of crimes, but he burned this house and he also robbed a bank in Texas. When he gets done with his crimes in Texas, he comes back to Anchorage. He goes to the shed to retrieve Samantha's body, but he is not done with her. He said he cleaned her up to make her look like she was still alive, and to keep her eyes open, he sewed them open. He then held a newspaper next to her and took the picture to make it look like she's still alive close to February 24th. 
He says, after he posted this ransom note on the 24th and texted the boyfriend, he drove 35 miles north and began to dispose of Samantha's remains in Mananuska Lake, which is a 62-acre surface area of lake. He said he had dismembered her, and then he wrapped up her body parts with baling wire and weights. He had drilled a hole in the ice because, in addition to murder, he also wanted to go ice fishing. So he takes her parts there, and while he's fishing, he drops her body parts in this hole. The FBI asked him, hey, did you catch fish? What did you do with the fish, or was that just a cover? He said, no, I was fishing, and I caught fish, and I took them home and ate them. Just very casually, like it was no big deal. It took the FBI dive team 10 hours to finally recover Samantha's remains. Well, after talking to him on this murder, they're like, hold on a minute. This guy is way too casual about this, and it was way too easy for him. He's not stressed at all. This was not his first time. Once he was confronted, he began to talk. Now, there is no one who knows me or who has ever known me who knows anything about me, really. They know... They're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you because I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about what I'm telling you, the kind of things I'm telling you, is me. How long have you been two different people? <laughs> long time. 14 years. So the audio clip you just heard is Israel Keys talking about himself and telling the FBI that he's two different people and that he's been this way for 14 years. So at this point, the FBI knows that this isn't Israel's first rodeo and we're probably de dealing with a serial killer. So let's talk a little bit about basic serial killer information. We hear that term thrown around a lot, but... We don't really look into what it means. According to Discover Magazine in a December 2020 article, at any given time there are 25 to 50 serial murderers at work. That's a pretty alarming statistic because these people are at work across the U.S., you know, and going undetected by law enforcement at this point. But serial murderers comprise less than 1% of all homicides. While it is very unnerving that there are 25 to 50 at work, they only make up less than 1% of all homicides. So I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, what is the definition of a serial killer? The actual definition, and there's a lot of different opinions on it, but according to the FBI, to qualify as a serial killer, you have to have killed three people in separate incidents, basically. So that is the definition of a serial killer according to the FBI. You've committed three murders in separate incidents. He tells them that his first victim was in 1997 or 1998 when he abducted and raped a young woman near Bend, Oregon. And he was convinced that he had messed up because he let her go. And he vowed to himself that he would never let another person go after that. He joined the army after the abduction and rape that took place in Bend, and he completed his three, year, three years in the army before he stalked his next victim. So he gets involved in this online relationship with a woman, and they get together and rent a home in Nia Bay, Washington. And he lived with her while working at the Parks and Recs department there, and they had a daughter together. And the birth of his daughter I guess convinced him to not hurt children. He was going to focus his victims, you know, on adults. He said it was a boring town and he just needed to do something. And that's where he lived and began hunting his next victim. He told the police that he liked to search parks, campgrounds, cemeteries, and boating sites for potential victims. He told them that they ranged in age from teenagers to elderly and were both men and women. So unlike a lot of serial killers we see that focus on one particular gender or one particular age range or both, 
He didn't care who the victim was. Right. It looks like he just, really the only rule he had was that it wouldn't be a child. So he tells the FBI that he killed in 10 or fewer states, but he never really would say exactly which states he was in. But he killed less than 12 people, is what he said, but he didn't provide any other information. But he told the FBI that it required meticulous planning. He planned and planned these crimes and that he would use cash everywhere he went, you know, to not leave a ATM or debit card trace that he took the battery out of his cell phone, took the tag off his vehicle, or even rented a vehicle so that his vehicle wouldn't be able to be tracked for these murders. Well, if the things that Israel Keys has done to this point is not sinister enough, he also buried what he called a murder cache, or these murder kits, all around the U.S., and the FBI also thinks in Canada. And these kits, or his murder cache, as he would call it, contained weapons, ammunition, silencers, cash, and things to help him clean up a crime scene and to also help with the decomposition of bodies. Now, the cash in there came from bank robberies that he had committed with the intent to support his crimes, not his lifestyle, but just his crimes. He said this kept him from having to purchase items which could lead to tracking him. And the items that were in the kits were purchased in advance, sometimes years in advance. And then they were put into these kits, and then the kits were either buried or hidden very well in all different locations. The kits were even placed years before the crimes. Now, one kit that they did recover, it was, you know, those orange five-gallon buckets you get from Home Depot that say Home Depot on the front? Well, it was that with a lid on it, and they found that at Blake Falls Reservoir in Adirondack Park in Parrishville, New York, very far away from Anchorage, Alaska. One was found on Eagle River in Alaska containing Drano and other items to help speed up decomposition. The FBI says as of 2021, they still don't know how many kits are out there or where they may be. The only hints he gave, he said he buried one near Green River, Wyoming. Well, they checked back through his paper trail. They were able to see that he traveled there September 2007, July 2008, and September 2011, but they haven't found that kit. He also told them that one was buried near Port Angeles, Washington, but they don't know the time frame of where it was buried after Israel Keyes confesses to the crime of Samantha, he only gives them one other full confession, and this was the murder of Bill and Lorraine Courier. Bill and Lorraine were a middle-aged married couple, and they lived in Essex, Vermont. They went missing on June 8, 2011. Well, in 2012, when they're talking to Israel Keyes, the couple is still classified as missing. Now, here's where it gets down to how meticulous and how conniving he was. Keyes flew from Alaska to Chicago, Illinois. In Chicago, Illinois, he rented a car, and then he drove a 1,000 miles to Vermont. He said this trip was planned specifically to go kill somebody. It was not any type of vacation or sightseeing. It was with the intent to kill. He said he already had one of his kill kits in the area, and he picked the couriers based on their house. He stayed at a hotel that was nearby, and he went out walking and saw their house and picked it because it looked like he would have ease of access of getting into the house through the garage without being detected, and they also didn't have children in the home. He said they were completely random victims. He knew that he wanted to kill a couple, but again, as in his crime with Samantha, it was more about the location. He said he went in through the garage. He broke an interior door window that led from inside the garage to inside the home, and that's how he was able to get into the home where he restrained them. He said he made sure they knew that he was the one in charge. 
he put them in their car and drove to an abandoned farmhouse. Now this abandoned farmhouse he had already scoped out earlier on so that he knew he had somewhere to take them. He said he started with Lorraine in the upstairs of the home. Bill was downstairs and he started yelling and trying to get free. So Israel Keys went downstairs and Bill said something to him that pissed him off, so he just began shooting him. He said once he killed Bill, he went back upstairs to Lorraine, and he strangled her. He left their bodies in the basement of the home. He then drove his rental car back to Chicago and flew back to Alaska. Now, the kill kit from this murder or these murders has never been found but he told them where they could find the silencer that he used, and they were able to recover that. Shortly after these murders, though, this farmhouse was demolished, and all the debris from where they tore it down was taken to a landfill. So the FBI goes to this landfill hoping to be able to recover Bill and Lorraine, and they even searched for 10 to 12 weeks and found nothing. But the biggest problem here was the time delay. This happened in June of 2011. We're in 2012, so there's a lot of pounds of debris brought in on top of the farmhouse. Like I said, that was his only other full confession because Keyes played with the police, and he would only hint around about things. Here are the other victims. We already know that 97 or 98 was his first crime. He said it was the summer of 1997 or the summer of 1998. And he doesn't know who this victim was, but it occurred in Malpin, Oregon, which is near Bend, Oregon. The victim was 14 to 18 years old, and he abducted this young woman while she was tubing on the Deschutes River. But the police think this crime was never reported. In July to October of 2001, he said this was his first murder, and it was while he was living in Nia Bay, Washington. But the identity and location of this victim are completely unknown because he wouldn't give any other details. July 2001 to 2005, he said he murdered a couple in Washington. Now, we don't know if this was a married couple, a dating couple, two strangers, don't know if they were tourists or visiting relatives because he didn't give any other information. And based on what he told them about Lorraine and Bill, he could have abducted them in another state and drove them to Washington where he murdered them. And all he would tell them in addition to this was that they might be buried near a valley. 2005 to 2006, he said there were two separate murders, and with both of these, he used his boat to dispose of their remains. Well, about 60 miles from Nia Bay is Lake Crescent, and Lake Crescent is a huge lake. It is one of the deepest in the entire United States. Parts of it are 500 to 700 feet deep. He said one of the victims he took out in his boat and was sunk in the lake there. And again, he said that was 2005 or 2006. And he said he didn't know or he wouldn't give the name of this victim. He also said that in the spring of 2009, he murdered and buried a victim in upstate New York, but he wouldn't provide details or a name. Well, the FBI became fairly confident this was Deborah Feldman. And in fact, now they have confirmed that Deborah Feldman is a confirmed fourth victim. Deborah was last seen alive April 8, 2009 at her home in Hackensack, New Jersey. And at the time she was 49 years old. Now she was last seen April 8th. What Keyes told them was on April 9th, he abducted a female on the East Coast. He took this female across multiple state lines, and when he got to New York, he murdered her and buried her body. And he said he buried her in upstate New York near the Tupper Lake area. They showed him pictures of various victims, 
And when they showed him a picture of Deborah, he would not confirm that it was her, but he also didn't deny that it was her. So on April 9th, he murders most likely Deborah. On April 10th of 2009, he robbed a bank in Tupper Lake, New York. And then June 8th, 2011, we know the couriers were murdered in Vermont. He also tells them one of his victims was a female who was driving an older car at the time of her abduction. She was very pale and possibly lived with her grandmother. He said her body was the only other body other than Samantha that had been recovered. He said what he did to her body made it look like it was an accident. And he said, in fact, this woman had been recovered and it had been ruled an accident. But again, don't know location and don't know the victim. Okay, so the FBI put together a detailed timeline of all the places that Israel Keys had traveled in the last 14 years, and they have states and cities, and we have that available at the link on our webpage. I'm just going to go over the states, but I want to encourage everyone to look at the complete FBI list so they can see what cities also. But he made his way through Alaska, Alabama, Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, Louisiana, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Nevada, New Hampshire, New York, North Dakota, Oregon, Texas, Utah, Vermont, Washington State, and Wyoming. They also know that he traveled to several parts of Canada in 2007, and when asked if he murdered anyone in Canada, he said, all he would tell them is that Canadians don't count. Now, I don't know if that was because he was talking to the American FBI or what, but that's what he said. He never said anything about killing anyone in Canada, but he only said that they didn't count. He, we also know that he traveled to several parts of Mexico. He was obviously in Egypt when he was in the army, and he was also, had also visited El Salvador and Belize. Meticulous, very, his crimes were very well thought out. There was nothing that was spur of the moment or, um, you know, just kind of went out one day and decided to do something. Everything was meticulously planned. And our interviews with him were the same from his standpoint. I mean, he, I don't, I never got the sense that he, you know, accidentally told us something or got angry and riled up and then something flew out of his mouth. He, my sense was that he knew every time he came in kind of what he was going to give us that day. Israel, he's had no remorse at all. He uh, he enjoyed what he did. He talked about enjoying what he did. He talked about, you know, had he not been caught, uh, some of his future plans and what he would have done, which included continuing to do what he was doing, continuing to um, to kidnap and murder people. So he, he had no remorse at all. He wanted the death penalty, and he wanted it fast. It was Speaking generally, that was what he wanted. There were little things along the way, um, that he wanted, you know, he wanted evidence returned to family members and things like that. But big picture, what he wanted, he wanted to avoid trials. He wanted to avoid publicity and media. He wanted to avoid being um, taken from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and tried in, you know, multiple places. And ultimately, he wanted the death penalty and he wanted it um, quickly. He didn't want to sit in jail for a long period of time. What you just heard is the FBI's take on Israel Keys. From the clip, you can learn that they thought he was playing and toying with them while also providing them some truths. And they said he really only hinted at his crimes. He did tell them, you will get the full story eventually. He was meticulous at planning and covering his crimes. He said he would not provide details of his crimes and give them names and locations until he got what he wanted. And what he wanted was the death penalty, and he wanted it quick. He said he didn't want publicity. He didn't want his name out there. He didn't want media attention. He wanted, did not want to be taken from state to state and tried on different crimes. He wanted to be killed, and he wanted to be killed quick. He was wanting to protect his family. He said he would not be satisfied sitting in prison all of his life. He wanted to go out of this world while he still had some sanity and good memories. In reference to this execution date and having it really quick, 
he wouldn't give information until he had this in writing. But he was voluntarily granting interviews for seven months, but he really didn't provide a whole lot of information. A lot of the information we have comes from the FBI tracing his paper trail and finding out where he had been. They said he seemed to enjoy this game of cat and mouse, but everything he did was controlled. He never got upset and angry and would blurt out information. He was giving them the information exactly as he wanted to. They said it was initially like talking with your neighbor, and then other times it was just chilling to the bone. During his time in jail, they found some paintings, and there were 11 separate paintings, and these paintings were of skulls, and Israel had painted these skulls using his own blood, and this is one of the other things that lead them to believe that there were 11 victims. But again, this could just be Israel wanting them to believe there were only 11 victims. Well, on December 1st, 2012, Israel Keyes was found dead in his jail cell. He had used a disposable razor where he slit his wrist, and he also attempted to strangle himself with his bed sheets. Underneath his dead body, a letter was found, but the letter he wrote was soaked in blood, so they had a hard time reading it. It was like on a legal sheet of paper, and part was written in pen, and part was written in pencil. The FBI sent this off to be analyzed so they could try to find out whatever it said and hoping it would give them more information about victims and being able to recover these victims and give their family some peace. But it was not. Once it was analyzed, most of it was poetry about murder and just basic ramblings. He disclosed absolutely nothing in this letter. So on December 1st, 2012, when Israel Keyes died, all of his secrets died with him. He had told the FBI, had he not been caught, he would have continued this spree of crimes and would continue having victims. They believe his crime span was from 1996 until 2012. They have been able to confirm four victims, but there are likely seven more, and that's just based on the information they have now, but there are potentially more than 11. And I think at this point, with Samantha, the reason he got caught is he had gotten away with so much and done so many things that didn't even get him looked at, that he just thought he was God and he could keep going. Now I'm going to play you an FBI audio clip, and this is an FBI agent speaking about the number of victims. We believe there are 11 victims total, and that is uh, based primarily on what Keith told us. He, he was evasive, um, like you mentioned, he was very evasive at times during interviews, and he told us um, when we tried to, to pin him down on a number, he would say it was less than 12. But then there were things that he would say um, that led us to believe that by less than 12, he simply meant 11. And so he, he was quick to correct us in interviews if we had something wrong. So there were several times where we just threw out statements like, you are 11 victims or things like that, and he didn't correct us. So based on that and, and some of just additional things that he said, we believe the number is 11. This case of Israel Keys would not be complete without discussing one more person. And I'm going to let B cover that for you. But just know Israel has not been linked to this crime and is not a suspect in this crime. He is a person of interest along with a whole lot of other people because we don't know the full details. So like Jen mentioned, while Keys hasn't been directly linked to this case, there is some indications that he could be involved, and that's the case of Julie Harris. Julie was 12 years old when she disappeared on March 3, 1996 in Colville, Washington. Now, if you'll remember, Colville is a small town in Washington. It's got a population of less than 5,000, and Israel Keys lived there at the same time, in fact, that this disappearance occurred. Israel was 18 at the time that 12-year-old Julie Harris disappeared. Now, Julie was a double amputee, 
And a week after her disappearance, her prosthetic feet and her bag were found beside the Colville River. And a year later, her skeletal remains were found in a wooded area near Kettle Falls. Now, Julie's mother, her boyfriend, Don Sachs, who lived at the residence with Julie and her mom, immediately became a person of interest because he was the last one to see her alive. Now, the day before her disappearance, Julie was upset because her mother would not allow her to go on a Special Olympics trip due to poor grades, but her mom and her brother went to the Special Olympics event without her and left her with Don Sachs. So Don Sachs, who we mentioned was the mother's boyfriend, had argued with Julie the night before about doing her homework. Witnesses reported that she was last seen walking towards her church. Someone told her mom that they had seen Julie walking down Main Street with a tall man in a trench coat. Now, the Stevens County Sheriff's Office has said that officially no one has been ruled out. Julie's mom believes that Sachs didn't have anything to do with it and that her daughter was, in fact, Israel Key's first victim. Now, this kind of goes against what we talked about earlier with Keyes saying that he had decided he would never hurt a child. But here's the twist in that this event happened before his daughter was born. So Julie Harris was 12 years old when she disappeared, and she disappeared prior to his daughter being born. So it's possible that Harris was his first victim, and he had not yet made that decision. If it was Israel that did this, once he decided that he wasn't going to kill children, and if he had already killed a child, it may not be something he would want to admit, because child killers are treated completely different in jail. Sure. And the FBI is still trying to link several unsolved homicides and robberies to Keys. And they haven't been able to. I don't know that we'll ever have the full extent of Israel Key's crimes. Uh, and I would agree with you on that. I want to read parts of the letter that was found in Israel's jail cell. And I'm just going to give you a few little blurbs from it. Okay, talk is over. Words are placid and weak. Back it with action or it all comes off cheap. Watch close while I work now. Feel the electric shock of my touch. Open your trembling flower or your petals I'll crush. Soon now you'll join those ranks of dead or your ashes the wind will soon blow. Family and friends will shed a few tears. Pretend it's off to heaven you go. But the reality is you were just bones and meat. And with your brain died, also your soul. Your face framed in dark curls like a portrait. The sun shone through highlights of red. What color, I wonder, and how straight will it turn, plastered back with the sweat of your blood. I feel your body tense up, my hand now on your shoulder, your eyes. Forget the lady called luck. She does not abide near me for her powers don't extend to those who are dead. And I'm gonna leave you with this one last thing. You can't really understand what's being said, but there's one part you can hear and you can hear it very well and you'll know it when you hear it. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. We'll see you next week. As always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, on Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud, outloud is two words, not one, on Twitter at tcoutloud, or on our website at truecrimeoutloud.com. Photos, links, and sources for this podcast can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com.